Ben Morowski here from FCP Euro with another one of our Explain series. Today we are talking all things cooling systems. Fuel, air, and spark are the three necessities for any internal combustion engine. However, that leaves out the only system dedicated to ensuring the engine can survive running for more than just a few minutes, cooling. Engines and their contained miniature explosions produce significant heat that will cause the engine to melt down if not countered, so it's up to the cooling system to ensure that doesn't happen. A running engine can only stay healthy when excessive heat is pulled out and dissipated, otherwise parts will just start breaking. And that's why so much emphasis needs to be put on the health of a vehicle's cooling system. It's the only one keeping the engine cool. So what's the cooling system and what does it do? Other than in older Volkswagens and Porsches, every engine in a car or truck uses a cooling system filled with a fluid type coolant. Engines have many moving parts that spin and actuate thousands of times in a minute, generating significant amounts of heat. Excessive heat is the enemy of the internal combustion engine, and as it'll shrink clearances and cause premature fatigue. The cooling system exists to prevent all of that and keep an engine at its most efficient operating range. Inside an engine, water jackets surround the bulk of the moving components. They're empty pockets through which engine coolant flows. As the water antifreeze pass by, they pull the heat out of the engine to keep it cool. From there, the coolant flows out of the engine to the radiator, dissipating all of that excessive heat. At the other end of the radiator, the cooled coolant is pulled back into the engine by the water pump, where it repeats the cycle. However, depending on the car, the coolant can also be routed elsewhere. The reality is cooling systems over time have become more and more complex and important with modern vehicles, no longer with its only purpose being to cool down the engine block. Things like turbochargers, throttle bodies, and even alternators are all sometimes water-cooled, making the importance and robust nature of your car's cooling system all the more important, yet all the more intricate. So let's give an overall breakdown of what comprises your car's cooling system. Again, the entire point of the cooling system is to remove heat from the engine. And while coolant is responsible for pulling the heat away from the engine, it's the radiator's job to pull that heat out of the coolant. As such, the radiator is a heat exchanger that uses airflow to cool the coolant and remove the heat. It consists of a plate and fin core with two tanks on either side. The tanks direct the coolant into and out of the core while the core exchanges all of the heat. When the coolant passes through the radiator, it travels through channels separated by thousands of thin fins. The fins effectively increase the coolant surface area and provide a very effective way of removing heat. Specifically, their effectiveness comes down to a few factors that you'll want to consider when buying a new one. So here's a few radiator characteristics to know. There's tank material, the core count, the pass count, and the fin count. OE radiators for non-performance SUVs and sedans are single pass, meaning the end of the radiator and move through the core without direction. However, many aftermarket radiator cores are multi-pass, whether dual or triple. In those cases, a wall or directing baffle forces the coolant to run across the core longer, giving it more exposure to the airflow, which pulls out more heat. Tank construction for OE radiators is almost always plastic. It's inexpensive, lightweight, easy to produce, but not the most durable. Heat cycling destroys the plastic's integrity, making it prone to cracks with age. And for that reason, many OE radiators need replacement around the 100,000 mile mark. Now moving to an aftermarket radiator like one from CSF will solve the issue as most of their products feature TIG welded aluminum tanks. Lastly, the amount of fins placed between the plates and the core will heavily affect how well it radiates heat. More fins means more surface area, which directly relates to cooling. Often this is where inexpensive no-name replacements kind of skimp, as they're tough to see. Without a detailed temperature gauge, the increase in average operating temperature won't be noticeable, but the surrounding components in your engine will feel it, causing them to wear quicker than maybe intended. So how does that coolant flow through the radiator in the first place? Well, that's where your water pump comes into play. As the name implies, the water pump pumps the coolant throughout the system, ensuring the engine remains properly fed with cooled coolant. They can be belt driven and mounted on the engine or electronic and away from it, but their purpose always stays the same. Electric water pumps have become the standard for many and have become the most popular among BMW products made in the last decade. While more complicated than a mechanical pump, they allow for variable control of the pump's speed, which allows the engine computer to alter coolant flow depending on how it wants the engine to perform. It's a large part of why their engines can be so fuel efficient while still making class fighting power. Mechanical pumps, on the other hand, utilize a pulley driven by a belt off of the crankshaft, so flow is directly determined by engine speed. It's not as advantageous for maximum efficiency, but it's a reliable and simple design that's been the standard for decades upon decades. 
Now, mechanical and electric pumps are similarly unreliable, typically lasting around 60,000 to 80,000 miles. Traditional pumps fail because their bearings wear and allow the pulley and impeller to move around. Electrical pumps, on the other hand, can last much longer but suffer from control module failures. Neither is suitable for your engine, and they'll both leave you stranded. Pumps pumping, coolant cooling, this is all starting to make sense until we get to the thermostat, statting. The thermostat regulates the cooling system flow. While engines can't get too hot, it's also important that they reach a specific operating temperature for their best performance. When the engine is cold and you fire it up, the thermostat is closed, preventing coolant flow. However, once the coolant with the engine heats up, the thermostat opens, allowing the coolant to cycle through and keep the engine within its operating range. Most thermostats are entirely mechanical in operation. They're nothing more than a simple valve pressed shut by a spring. On the engine side of the valve, there's a cylinder containing wax with a push rod connected to it. As the engine coolant warms, the wax melts and expands, eventually pressing on the rod, opening the valve, and allowing the coolant to cycle through. However, with all its historic cooling system woes, BMW, of all people, has taken a slightly different approach in the last decade. The characteristic MAP thermostat is an advanced electronically controlled thermostat and thermostat housing. They come as one unit, a black plastic sphere with several orifices for coolant flow. The idea behind them is similar to the variable electric water pump and is used in tandem with them. Again, it's all about efficiency and highly regulated coolant temps have shown to affect that, so it becomes the norm. While there's more to go wrong with BMW's modern thermostat, it won't leave you stranded if it does break. Once electronic control fails, for whatever reason, it defaults to the wax regulated thermostat within. Of course, that can too fail, no matter the application. Failures can occur in the open or closed position, neither of which is really great. Fully open will allow you to drive uninhibited, but the engine will take much longer to reach operating temperature if it ever gets there. Failing closed will prevent coolant flow, causing the engine to ultimately overheat. So we've talked a lot about coolant so far without actually talking about coolant. So as you may have assumed by now, coolant is a liquid pumped through the whole system. In its earliest form, engine coolant was simply distilled water. But as we know, that doesn't work very well in freezing temperatures. Frozen water inside an engine can crack the iron or aluminum surrounding it. It also has a relatively low boiling point compared to where engines should operate, leading us to develop antifreeze. As it is known today, coolant is a 50-50 mixture of water and antifreeze, forming a kind of super water. The water isn't different, but antifreeze is a concentrated mixture of chemical compounds, the most important being glycol. When added to water, glycol raises the boiling point and lowers the freezing point stabilizing it for use in almost every application while also containing the lubricants that help the water pump and thermostat function effortlessly. The remaining chemicals are corrosion inhibitors and dyes, orange, green, red, or blue. Corrosion inhibitors are critical to the material that the engine is made from and largely determine which mixture is correct for your car. Getting into them beyond that becomes a very involved conversation that isn't best had here, but don't worry, you can look in depth at all things coolant with our coolant guide linked above. Next up is the radiator hoses, and they honestly are as simple as they sound. Nothing more than rubber reinforced with cord. They carry the coolant between the radiator, engine, and water pump while allowing the engine to vibrate and shift. Without any moving parts, there really isn't much to go wrong with them other than age-related failures. Repeated heat cycling over tens of thousands of miles will deteriorate the rubber, eventually splitting if not replaced. Replacing a radiator hose means opening up the entire cooling system. So if you can, install some fresh ones during a water pump or radiator replacement. Those jobs provide the perfect excuse to check their health, though you can do that whenever you're under the hood. And while in there, check the plastic components in surrounding areas. Chances are something is going to need replacing. So where does that coolant come from and how does it enter your car's cooling system in the first place? If you look at the cap on your radiator expansion tank, you'll see a bold message warning you not to open the cap while the car is hot. Ignoring that warning will surely end up with a large plume of nearly 300 degree water and steam shooting out in a seam reminiscent of Yellowstone's Old Faithful. If you're lucky, you'll stay dry, but you'll likely be hit with a scalding hot coolant. As the cooling system heats up, it builds pressure. Pressure is good for the system as it forces out any air pockets that would cause hot spots and raises the boiling point of the coolant mixture. However, there is such a thing as excess pressure, and it's the radiator caps or expansion tank caps job to release it in a controlled manner. A bad cap won't hold pressure, which can cause the engine to overheat. Different systems deal with pressure buildup differently, but most modern European vehicles utilize an expansion tank. As the name implies, this tank gives the coolant a place to cycle through when pressure builds. The tanks are exclusively plastic, and as with most other components mentioned above, 
The lightweight and inexpensive material is prone to cracking with age. It's a common failure for many Euros, Volkswagens, BMWs, and the 996, 986 generation Porsches, and not an enormous deal when caught early. Unfortunately, if you do miss it, it can blow up on the road, leaving you unable to drive without hurting the engine. So how do you maintain your cooling system on your car? As we've discussed, the cooling system is comprised of many parts, and each of them have different service intervals. Replacement intervals also vary between make and model, depending on the era in which they were built and the engines that they're a part of. If you'd like to ensure the health of your cooling system for miles to come, the answer is quite simple. Keep up with your maintenance. Engine coolant should be the most common service item within the system. Although several manufacturers claim that the fluid is a lifetime fill, that's more for making their products look more environmentally friendly. Realistically, you should flush and refill coolant every three years or 50,000 miles to prevent electrolysis from worn down antifreeze additives. The electrolysis process can happen as the antifreeze portion of the mixture wears down and a minor electrical charge is put through the system. The electric charge will seek the path of least resistance, ground itself on the aluminum or iron components, and ultimately start to eat them away. Next up, the water pump and thermostat will have a replacement interval between 60,000 and 80,000 miles. Often, one will fail before the other, but they work so closely connected that it almost always makes sense to replace them as a pair. Although you won't see when the thermostat fails, mechanical water pumps often have a weep hole that leaks a tiny amount of coolant and essentially warns you that it needs to be replaced as soon as possible. The radiator and expansion tanks are relatively resilient and can last well over half of a decade if not abused. However, plastic is a bit of a wild card regarding its durability, so consider replacing them around that 5 year mark or 100,000 miles, whichever comes first. The hoses are also a case by case item. but are often inexpensive, so replacing them with a more extensive service or replacement is an easy way to ensure peace of mind. Now we can't talk about all this without talking about upgrading. So OE components are tough enough for daily commuting, and that's kind of about it. Some models can have optional packages that add additional coolers or a beefier system, but the one constant that always remains is plastic. Lightness and cheapness mean savings for the customer and better driving dynamics, so it's no mystery why automakers love the stuff. But Look at any race car, you'll find none rocking it within their cooling systems. Metal parts are marginally heavier, but light years more durable. OE suppliers like CSF have a strong and well-known aftermarket side dedicated to building the best radiators, all of which use aluminum tanks. Beyond the better build quality, CSF has proprietary technology proven to improve cooling characteristics over OE heat exchangers. Their B-tube technology is a unique way of shaping the tubes through which the coolant flows. It provides a stronger tube shape that makes them thinner increasing thermal efficiency by 15% over the conventional shape. CNC machined aluminum fittings in a race-style drain plug are also included. Opening the thermostat earlier also makes it easier to keep the system cool. Race thermostats are an excellent option for regularly tracked vehicles as they open at a lower temperature than the industry standard 180 degrees. These are especially effective for Porsche sports cars, for example, as their radiators are easy to clog and relatively small for the amount of coolant in the system. Make and generation specific fixes as with the low temperature thermostat mentioned above and an aluminum flange for BMWs, N5X, and N2X engines are reasonably popular. Colloquially, known as the Mickey Mouse flange, the OE plastic fitting is notorious for becoming so brittle that it crumbles if you look at it the wrong way. This is technically an upgrade, but at this point, it's just a must for any of those engines. More applicable to a larger number of vehicles are silicone hoses. Rubber lines work perfectly well in most applications, but repeated use in high stress applications such as the racetrack can cause rapid degradation. Instead of running that risk with OE hoses, you can pick up a set of silicone hoses from GO88 or Mishimoto. Silicone hoses have a much better thermal tolerance than rubber, which will last longer, especially in those extreme situations. However, they're porous enough that your coolant mixture will slowly evaporate through the hoses. For that reason, they're best utilized on a dedicated track vehicle, unless you're checking your coolant level regularly. All right, so we spoke upgrades, we spoke maintenance intervals. We try to give you an overview of how the whole system works. We hope you learned a lot in this video. If you're ever looking to DIY on anything in your cooling system, head over to our DIY channel designated to giving you step-by-step -step tutorials on how to fix your car at home. Please like, comment, subscribe, and if you have any more questions, put them down below. We'll see you on the next one.